All right. <coughs> so uh, let's continue. So um, so this is the third, the third and I guess final part uh, of my lectures. So um, let me try to use this word for a while. Um, again, the, the you know this is the third part. We've so far we've talked about kind of damage reduction as a tool um, for speeding up some numerical and algebra problems in particular. But you know it it is kind of it goes much beyond. As in, you know maybe I introduced these tools and you know gave the wrong impression that you know here is the one application for those tools. Those tools are much much wider and you know just chose kind of one application which is. Kind of very natural or kind of gives you know very impressive results, uh, but those tools are really kind of used for many different types of problems as well. Okay, so dimension reduction, sketching, which is kind of computational variant. And we are back online. So, um, right. So uh, now I'll talk about kind of space partitions and a particular application will be nearest neighbor search. Uh, this will connect to the problem that we started with, kind of this, this closed pair problem or similarity search. And uh, the tool that we'll be talking about is a certain kind of space partition which will be a little bit less clear, but it is reducing the, the size of the data into something smaller, kind of less clear than image reduction or sketching, but the goals will be the same. It will be a form of transforming the data from some form to a different form, which is computationally much more efficient to work with. Okay, that will be roughly uh, the idea. And there will be more kind of, you know, things that, you know, don't necessarily fit into these three categories, which, you know, you should expect to always write that. Um, things don't always kind of partition into three nice parts. All right, so, uh, so the definition, how many of you have heard definition of nearest neighbor search? Okay, about, uh, okay, less than I heard. Uh, thanks, so okay, so, so here is the definition. This is the, the you know, closest pair problem, but the online version, the data structure uh, problem, uh, where uh, we have a bunch of points, endpoints, again, thinking about them as being, living in really high dimensional space, uh, we want to pre-process them. Uh, we'll also have uh, an to, you know, pre-process to build a data structure. We we'll also have an approximation C bigger than one, right? And uh, you know, think about this as one plus epsilon. But you know, we'll think about slightly higher approximations uh, in for this problem. Okay. So. Um, and again, we need to consider approximation because kind of the exact version will be you know hard for us to do anything really. Um, uh, okay, so, so we want to pre-process these endpoints, so that given a new query point Q, we want to find the closest point, right? Let's say uh, this point P star. Okay, and uh, right, so this is, this is the nearest neighbor problem. Uh, we'll actually consider and mostly talk about a, a close variant of this problem, in particular near neighbor problem, where we have a threshold R. Okay, so think about this as rather than saying like find the closest point, I want to find a point which is at least this similar, kind of right, within distance R. Okay, and uh, uh, so what does it mean? So for exact problem, you know, it is, the definition is clear, you know, if approximation is, is one basically, right? there is no approximation, then you say, well, given a query point Q, it is okay to report either of these two points, right? Either this one or this one within this green ball of radius R. Okay, now the approximate version, 
is uh, slightly different, is, is as follows. We have two balls, one of radius r and one of radius cr. And think of approximation c as being two, pretty much for the rest of, the, of, of most of the slide. So we're saying as long as there is a point in the green ball, it is okay to report something in the green ball or the gray annulus, but not in this red outskirt, okay? If there is nothing in the green ball, we may or may not report something in this gray, uh, gray annulus. In that sense, it is an approximate problem. Okay, you can think about this as, you know, sometimes these algorithms kind of in practice used as a kind of filtering mechanism, which say that, well, I'll report a less list of points, which includes all the points in this green ball, uh, and may include some points in the gray annulus, may or may not. Right, so this is, this is kind of the approximation, where the approximation comes from. Okay, and then later, you know, if you want, you can kind of go through this list and, you know, extract only the near neighbors or the nearest neighbor. Uh, uh, or, you know, another way to think about this is if there are no points in this gray annulus, then, you know, the, the exact and approximate versions are exactly the same. Okay, so this is, so this is the data structure question. Okay, and of course the idea would be to kind of use, you know, as fast pre-processing as possible using as small space as possible so that the query for a given query point Q is as fast as possible, okay? And this problem has many applications in particular to the closest pair problem, right? The very first problem that I mentioned yesterday um, and, you know, how do you use it? Um, you, you know, for example, you can build a data, you could build a data structure on the entire set of your images, or, you know, you represent it as Euclidean vectors, and then query each of the image into this data structure. So if your query is very efficient, then, you know, you should improve runtime to less than uh, quadratic. Okay, so, you know, of course, kind of the, the, the simplest solution for this problem is basically, well, given a new query point Q, just iterate over all points, so the query time will be N. Okay, and this will result in a closest pair pro, uh, solution which runs in quadratic time. So as long as we improve uh, the query time from looking at all the points to only a, a much smaller subset, we will improve the closest pair as well from n squared to something less than that. Okay, it has many other applications, a kind of in near neighbor kind of problems like where it's not a distance, but let's say max mean inner product, uh, but also for uh, for speeding up certain computation, as, as a, so it is a fundamental primitive that appears very often in different other high dimensional computational problems, um, and like clustering, uh, for example. Uh, but also kind of you know in things which are a little bit you know perhaps less obvious from the beginning, for example, speeding up greedy coordinate descent, kernel approximation and estimation problems, and so forth. Okay. Yes. Quick question. You said we report everything in the green. We may report things. Reporting something in the gray, you report every point in the gray, or you select what we're reporting? No, 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 no. This is this is this is where we don't have a guarantee. As in the algorithm, will uh, or put differently again. If there is a point in the gray ball, yep. right, then the algorithm is allowed to report something in the gray ball or in the gray analysis. Right, so you say, well, I know that there is something with the distance r, I'll report something which is perhaps a little bit further away, namely cr, but not more than that. Okay, and basically the technique that, you know, gave these sublinear t uh, query time algorithms are, are based on this notion of space partitions, and one of them, kind of, uh, one of the central ones is what is called locally sensitive hashing, okay? And uh, so in, in, introduced uh, by Indic Matwani in, uh, back in 98. And basically what it is, is it's a, it, again, it's a space partition or equivalently, this is a random hash function defined on our space, right? So let's think about, let's say space now as being Euclidean space. So this is our, this blob is our Euclidean space. Uh, so this, this local sensitive hashing is a random hash function G defined on this space. So it maps this Euclidean space into a discrete space, which is equivalent can be thought of as a space partition, right? So it is partitioned into parts, such that, you know, a part is defined by all the points that have exactly the same hash value. Okay, so, uh, so this is a space partition, and basically what we want from this space partition is uh, the following. We want that points that are close, so close means that, let's say, you know, the query and the point P are close if they are within this smaller radius R, right? If it is in this gray ball, kind of. 
So for a query, so P is kind of the a good answer for uh, for Q. Okay, we want that the probability over the random choice of this hash function that the Q and P are in the same part to be high. Okay, whereas for points which are far, so let's say P prime is in this red uh, outskirts kind of, uh, so it, it's definitely not even an approximate near neighbor, then we want that in that case a point, let's say Q and P prime, do not collide, are in different, uh, do not collide, or put differently that they are in the same part, or have the same hash value with very small probability. Okay, so suppose we can build such a hash function and suppose, you know, of course it depends exactly what is high and small, but suppose somehow uh, would be, you know, magically we can build such a hash function so that this high is really high, close to one, and the small is really small but it is pretty much zero. Okay, so if we have such a hash function, then the algorithm becomes very simple. In particular, uh, we can just build a hash table. Okay, so suppose this is a data set, we pick such a random hash function satisfying this property, we just take a hash table, basically we have a, a bucket for each, uh, you know, for each part of the space, and you know, the points that are in the corresponding part of the space are put in that bucket, okay? And what happens is that when your query comes, the uh, queue is given at the query time, you just look up the corresponding bucket, and these properties, this property says that you know, if there exists a near neighbor within distance R, then it should be in the same bucket because, well, this probability is pretty much one. And furthermore, this bucket doesn't contain any other false positives. Right? Because the probability that a far point is in the same bucket is, is pretty much zero, so there shouldn't be any false positives. Okay, so that bucket is pretty much the answer. Okay, so very simple. Basically, look at the, the, uh, the space is linear in N because, you know, there are only N points, so this is how much space we'll, we'll need in total. Uh, and the query time is, you know, essentially a constant, right? You know, modulo computing this hash function of the point Q. Okay, it's just a lookup. All right, now the problem is, of course, I, I, you know, if you think a little bit through it, you know, it should be obvious that you cannot really obtain such a big gap, right? It is too much to hope for to say that this probability should be one and this probability should be zero, because, well, these boundaries between parts must be somewhere, and the points kind of close to these boundaries are separated. Okay, so there is some non-trivial probability that, you know, even if both these things are close, they're just on the, on the wrong sides of the boundary, okay? So we cannot get these probabilities to be really, uh, you know, one and zero. Uh, but we'll settle for something, you know, but still maybe we can extract something from this notion that, you know, close points stay together and far points kind of go apart, you know, most likely. Except, you know, maybe we relax the parameters and, you know, we'll settle for something, you know, maybe we won't require this to be high, but, you know, something not so small. Most importantly, but this not so small is bigger than this small, so that we have some gap between, you know, the close points versus the far points. Okay, so, you know, not so small means that, well, perhaps there will be a smaller probability that when the query queue maps into this hash table, we'll actually find our near neighbor in that bucket. So we'll just have to repeat this experiment a few times. So we'll build a few hash tables, each kind of with an independent function g. You know, roughly the number of hash tables will be one over this not so small, so that, you know, it happens with constant probability over all the hash tables. So this means that, you know, we pick a few random partitions, uh, you know, for each of them we build a hash table and hope that at least in one of these hash tables for, you know, a future query Q, it will collide with a near neighbor P at least in one of these hash tables like this. Okay, now, you know, the question, you know, now the space grows linear with the number of hash tables, the query time grows linear with the number of hash tables, how many hash tables do we need? Right? this becomes a central question now. And obviously it depends on this gap, kind of, right? How, how well can we, um, you know, how good of a function G can we build? Okay, so in general, you know, when you do these space partitions, uh, you know, oftentimes this, you know, you can draw kind of a, a, a function, which is basically the probability of collision of, of two points P and Q as a function of their distance. Okay, and it would be, you'd expect it to be a decreasing function, at least, you know, the type of partitions that they're drawing, you'd expect that the further they are away, the, the less likely they are to be in the same part. Okay, so the two 
you know, th these probabilities are con concrete points on this graph, right? So we'll call it P1 to be the probability, the lower bound on the probability that, you know, if points are within distance R, then the probability of collision at least P1, and P2 is an upper bound that if the points have distance at least CR, then this is the probability of collision, right? So these are two points on the graph. And the number of hash tables looks like this formula. Um, in particular, it is n to the power rho, where rho is a constant. It is between zero and one. It depends on these probabilities P1 and P2, according to this formula. Uh, it looks like an ugly formula, uh, I'll admit, but it is, I, I'll, I'll show where it comes from. Actually, you know, there is a relatively simple reason where it comes from. Um, but since P1, P, you know, just by this graph, P1 is always bigger than P2, uh, this rho is always less than one. Okay, so, well, basically, I told you, I pretty much told you the algorithm for solving this inverse search, uh, except that, you know, except for this function g. Okay, how do we pick this uh, random hash function? Okay, and, you know, do there exist hash functions which give kind of non-trivial gaps between these probabilities p1 and p2? Okay, and, uh, and indeed there exist, and I, I wouldn't be mentioning this if, if there weren't. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, and uh, before giving you an example, uh, let me uh, just mention that, you know, the way you build this hash function is that, you know, like a, you know, as a hash function, you can always build it, uh, build it as a concatenation of a few hash functions. Okay, so this is, this is how we'll, uh, this, this is how we'll build this function G, uh, and it will be a concatenation of K hash functions, which are kind of more primitive, and two points now collide, if they collide in each of these primitive hash functions, H1 up to HK. Okay, this, I mean, this is just useful because it allows us to introduce this parameter K, which, you know, we'll see on, uh, in, in two slides how we'll, we'll be using. Okay, but, okay, let's, let's see what is, you know, you know, how to build such an example of such hash functions. And let's consider the example of a Hamming space. Okay, just, in a sense, the simplest case, and you know, this was actually the first space for which the, these locality hash functions were defined. And, um, and here is the primitive, actually, yeah, maybe somebody in the audience can suggest a hash function who has well, not seen them before. So you want to pick a random hash function such that two points that are closer collide with higher probability than two points that are further away. And again, the number of, what is the, what is the Hamming space? Well, we have two binary strings. The, the distance between them is the number of different coordinates. And so we want to pick a random hash function so that if the number of different coordinates is small when they collide with kind of good probability, and if the number of different coordinates is very large, when they collide with much smaller probability. Yeah. This doesn't work. Um, all right, so, well, we can pick a random coordinate. Okay, so if we pick a random coordinate, if the points have few different coordinates, the probability that we choose one of these different coordinates, is, which is when they will be in different buckets, will be small, or put differently, we now, the probability that we choose a coordinate on which we agree is large. And if the points are very far away, this means that there are many different coordinates, there are fewer agreeing coordinates, the probability that we choose a random coordinate where we agree is much smaller. So at least intuitively, this is a locally sensitive hashing, func uh, locally sens sensitive hashing <coughs> hash function. Okay, and you know, just to connect it back to here, this means, you know, G of P will be a concatenation of primitive hash functions, each of them chosen IAD from this random distribution which corresponds to picking k random bits. Okay, so note that this is very similar to this dimension reduction. Basically, we pick k random bits, 
Okay, and uh, and this is our hash function. This is pretty much the dimension reduction that I kind of mentioned my first, second or third slide uh, yesterday. Okay. So, um, all right, so let's see what is the, you know, um, what are these probabilities P1 and P2. Okay, and we can compute this for functions H because we, this, this parameter rho will be, you know, exactly the same for the functions H and G just the way they are combined. Um, I won't go through this calculation, but you know, just to compute for this function h, you know, what is the probability p1 and p2, just to see a value of this row, how this looks like. Well, the probability that two points p and q collide under this hash function, well, it is, you know, it is one minus probability that we do not collide as we go to different buckets. What is the probability we go to different buckets? Well, this means that we, for them to go to different buckets, we, you know, we must have chosen a coordinates where we differ. What is the probability that we chosen a random coordinate and that random coordinate, in that random coordinate points P and Q differ? Well, it's exactly the Hamming distance, with the, you know, by definition, number of different coordinates divided by the number, total number of coordinates. So now we can, you know, this is our function, right? This is the graph. Right, it decreases linearly with the, with the Hamming distance. Okay, and we can compute P1, right? So P1 will be basically a lower bound for when this distance, the Hamming distance is uh, at most R. Right? So this means that P1 is equal to one minus R by D. And you know, let me use an estimation that this is roughly equal to E to minus R by D. So at least when R is much smaller than D, this is a good approximation. Okay, I'm just using this approximation just to compute row at the end kind of sequence. Okay, the same with far points. So P2 is, is an upper bound on the probability of collision when the points are a distance uh, at least CR. Right, so again, just replace this with CR, we get this. We do the approximation, this is E to minus CR by D. And now we can plug it in into the formula for row. Right, so we plug in P1, we plug in P2, right, we get that this is R divided by D, this is CR divided by D, we get that rho is equal to one over C. Voila, now the exponent of the query time is basically one over C, and let's say for approximation two, this is a half. So the number of hash tables becomes root n. Okay, so I mean, this is kind of more kind of, of a proof of existence. Um, and uh, yeah, so we can get something non-trivial for as long as the approximation is bigger than one. Okay, and just to kind of recap, so what will be the full algorithm? Well, we'll build a data structure which has L, capital L, n to power row hash tables. Each hash table uses a fresh random, this LSH function, uh, GI, which is composed of these primitive functions. Okay, and we have the entire data set uh, into, uh, into each of these tables. Okay, at query time, we, we take the query, we, we go for each hash table, we look for the collisions in that bucket. We iterate for all the points in that bucket and you know, in all hash tables, and uh, we stop when we encounter a point which is a valid answer, namely it is an approximate near neighbor. So some a point within distance CR, we see it, we report it, and we're done, let's say. And basically the, the, well, the guarantees or the parameters will be that the space will be, there are L hash tables, each hash table takes roughly N space. Okay, so this will be N to one plus rho, plus the space to sort the original points, let's say. Okay, the query time will be the number of hash tables uh, times the uh, time it takes to compute the hash tables, plus the time it takes to iterate through all the points in the hash table. Okay, so it turns out that will be D and this will be an expectation. Okay, we'll, we'll prove this on the next uh, slide actually. Okay, this is, and the probability of success of finding a, a, a good point within distance here will be at least 50%. Okay, so, so here is the analysis. I mean, it's not the full analysis, but you know, at least I'll, I'll, you know, I'll show you where the, the parameter row comes from. Okay, so in particular, how do we choose these parameters K and L? 
uh, to, to get those guarantees? Well, right, so we have L hash tables uh, with this uh, hash function G, which is concatenation of K primitive hash functions, okay? And uh, we can, so P1 and P2, we computed with P1 and P2 for the hash functions H1 up to HK. Uh, and uh, we can now compute what is the probability of collision for this under function G. Now this is a concatenation of the K independent hash functions so that probability of collision will drops exponentially in K. In particular probability of collision of far points for under one hash function is P2 but if you concatenate K of them becomes P2 to power K. Right? Because Collision under function G means collision under each of the K primitive hash functions H. Similarly, collision for close pair is P1 to power K. Again, this is collision under function G. Okay, and pictorially, pictorially this is how it looks like, right? So you, you fix some primitive hash function like, you know, we've done on the previous slide where you pick a random coordinate, right? And it gives you some graph, right? Which, which decays like this. Now what we want to do, I mean, what, what this parameter K allows us is to control, in a sense, the gap between P1 and P2, right? What it allows us to do is that, well, if you choose a, uh, you know, a higher K, then we raise basically this graph to some power K. This means that the drop is sharper in a sense. Okay? It's, it's hard to draw these numbers which are subunitary, uh, but you know, the, the higher power we raise to the sharper will be the drop between P1 to power K and P2 to power K. Sure. Okay, so, okay, so how do we choose K? Right, so, so what, I mean, what, 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 I mean, how does the algorithm go, right? So we have a hash table, right? So, you know, just look, thinking about one hash table, we take the query, we go into the bucket, okay? And, you know, if there exists a, a, a close point, right, a close neighbor, uh, or an approximate one, when we are done, you know, we'll find it and we report a correct answer. The trouble is when there are many far points that somehow collide with the query point. Right? This is really the, where the trouble lies, that there are many uh, points that may collide. Well, how many far points can collide with the query point? Well, it will be each of them collides with this probability, p2 to the power k, there are n of them, right? So it will be n times this p2 to the power k. Well, we'll set k so that this is equal to one over n, so that in expectation, the number of false positives in a bucket is n times this two to the power k is only one or less than one. So we set, we set k such that the number of false positives in a bucket is at most a constant. Okay, and you know, now k is some formula. It, 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 you know, we don't really even need to compute this formula uh, for this proof. But now uh, we, can, we can compute what is this value. In particular, uh, P1 is equal to P2 to the power rho by definition of the rho. Right? So we define rho, we define rho as being equal to log of one over P1 by log of one over P2. You can verify that this is exactly the same as saying that P1 is equal to P2 to the power rho. Okay, so now, you know, so we have this by definition of a rho, we switch rho and k, this becomes P to power k to power rho, so this is one over n to power rho. Okay, that's it, this is where, this, you know, this includes the definition of the rho, why do we get you know, this probability, this is how many hash tables we need. Right, so this means that if we were to use just one hash table, then the expected number of false positives is a constant that we can iterate and filter out. Okay, at the same time, the probability that a close pair is in the bucket, and hence success, is <coughs> one over n to power rho. It's a admittedly small probability, but we can repeat the experiment, in a sense, this one hash table experiment, you know, order of one over this quantity, namely order of n to power rho times, and this means that we'll boost the success probability to some constant. So as long as we take the number of hash tables to be n to power rho, where these are the independent repetitions, then the success probability will be boosted to a constant now over all these hash tables. 
Let's leave it. That's the pretty much proof why the LSH works. Okay, other, I think this is the only proof in, in today's lecture, I think. Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, putting all together so far, we've, we got basically some nearest neighbor search algorithm for Hamming space. Uh, let me describe you actually the, the LSH algorithms for Euclidean space. Um, so here is, here is a way to build, uh, again, a, a hash function with LSH hash functions for the Euclidean space. Okay, this is our blob. Uh, so one way to do it is, you know, a bunch of points. One way to do it is basically to impose a, a regular grid. Okay, now a regular grid will, is, you know, there is no randomness, right? I mean, we expect there to be some randomness. Um, so the randomness that introduced is basically take this grid, you randomly shift it, randomly rotate it, and basically, you know, the, the parts, the cells that you see will be the hash buckets. Okay, so you do, you do this, and, you know, this is your space partition, and you, know, you can compute P1 and P2, and the type of bounds that you get, that your exponent row is, will be, again, one over C, actually a little bit less than one over C, uh, but, you know, about that. Okay, very similar to the one that we got for the Hamming space. Okay, so, you know, now the game, the game becomes uh, as follows. Um, well, can we get better raw? And the answer is yes, we can get better raw. And, uh, and this is kind of really one of those, I mean, one of the phenomena that is interesting to high dimensional geometry. Okay, and in particular, you can get a better space partition um, by replacing, you know, partitioning. So, you know, what this partition does, it partitions the space into these regular boxes, basically, right, regular cells. So, so but this is not the best way to partition Euclidean space. Okay, it doesn't quite correspond to the, uh, to the Euclidean geometry too well. Better way to partition is into cells which looks, look more like hypersphere. Okay, so in two dimensional space, this means spheres. So here is a method that will give rho which is roughly equal to one over C squared. Um, uh, so we'll, instead of kind of taking a random, randomly shifted grid, you take a random uh, a grid of balls, randomly shift, shift it. Now ideally what you want, you want to tessellate the space into, into hyperspheres. Right, Tesla is basically partition the space precisely into, into spheres. Now this is not possible already in dimension two. Right, you cannot take a bunch of oranges, let's say in three dimensional space, right? You cannot take a bunch of oranges and pack them so that there is no air between them. Right? There is no, no, you know, there is no way to do it. Um, so, uh, so what you do instead, you, you know, you approximate the process of partitioning the space into roughly hyperspheres. So how we'll do it is as follows. So you take a grid of these balls, okay? And each of them will define a bucket. When you take another one, uh, again, randomly shift it, and they will kind of carve out or eat up the remaining space, <coughs> okay? So you do this a bunch of times until basically the entire space is covered, okay? And basically each of these connected colored components is its own hash bucket. And, and you can prove that, you know, the, the, the row that you get will be roughly one over C squared, which is, let's say, for approximation two improves from exponent of a half to a quarter. So the, quarter, the number of hash tables goes from root n to fourth root of n. Okay, so good. This was uh, Omri question. Are you saying that all the rows of letters in the spaces, they are small spaces? Yes, yeah, yeah, I'll get there in, in, in a minute, exactly, yeah. Just, just a minute, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as in, you, you're asking the question that I was trying to ask now, right? Uh, in particular, well, can we do even better? Right, like how far can we push this? Can we, how, how good of a quality of the space partition can we get? Not that this is a purely mathematical question, really, right? I mean, we take space, we do a random space partition. There is, there is you know, really nothing about algorithms, it's just purely mathematical question. How good can we do with random space partitions? Okay, and uh, in particular, can we improve this? Turns out that no. 
Okay, this basically this partition is basically close to the best possible partition in the Euclidean space. So close to optimal. And I should mention for Hamming space, the bit sampling one, the one that I mentioned at the beginning, is also the optimal one. You cannot do better than that. Okay, and in general, uh, you know, how can you argue these things, right? This is, um, uh, I mean, this is studied in, in, in functional analysis and it's an example of isopermetry, uh, isopermetry kind of questions. And, you know, while it is not exactly the same question as proving lower bound here, uh, here is a very related question, um, uh, which is as follows. Uh, suppose, again, we have, you know, d-dimensional space, but you can even think, let's say, of three-dimensional space. You have uh, a, a fixed volume of clay, right? Uh, you know, of, of volume one, basically. And you say, well, I can shape any body I want out of this clay. Which of the bodies will have the smallest perimeter? Okay. What is the answer to this question? Okay. This, you know the answer to this question, so I'll wait until you answer. Sphere, thank you. Yes, it's a, it's a sphere. Uh, so, you know, one can prove this, you know, mathematical statement, mathematical theorem. Um, it's here. This is pretty much the reason why partitioning Euclidean space into spheres gives the best locally sensitive hashing uh, function. Okay, this is, you know, I guess for, for, for experts kind of, Fixing volume to be one roughly fixes the probability P2. Uh, minimizing the perimeter is pretty much maximizing the P1. Right? The perimeter is the, you have a boundary. You want to have a small probability as possible of hitting the boundary, namely where you take the point P and you point, uh, take a point Q. You think about them as being a needle. You pick the, you, you throw them, let's say, randomly in the sphere, the probability that they cross the boundary, namely they will not collide, will be roughly proportional to the, you know, to the boundary of this part, uh, or to the perimeter of this body. Yeah, this is like a very hand wavy kind of argument, where this, is, this question is related, but, you know, one can prove this kind of directly, these kind of questions. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is what is known uh, for our stage. So, you know, is this the end of nearest neighbor search? You know, uh, I, I guess, you know, I should mention that this, the second result uh, I, I, you know, proved with my uh, PhD advisor, Piotr Rindig, uh, during my PhD studies. And, you know, for a while we thought that, yes, you know, probably this is the best we can do for nearest neighbor search. So it turns out, and, and this is kind of m much more recent, uh, well, more recent than 2006 work, uh, with a number of coffers, uh, Petr Indyk, Heng uh, Ilya Rosenstein, uh, where we showed that you can get better maps if your space partitions are more aware of the data set. So it is a form of data dependent algorithm which basically says, well, you know, maybe it is, you know, so far whenever we talked about dimension reduction and sketching and, and here with space partitions, we always chose them independently of the data set. We are data set oblivious, right? We, we choose them randomly somehow, and then we show that for any given data set, they work with some probability, right? So for nearest neighbor search, we say, well, we have a concrete data set at hand. Maybe we can somehow take the data set a little bit prepare for that particular data set, use the information of the data set to improve our space partitions. Okay, but, you know, I mean, I don't really have time kind of to go into detail here, but uh, I mean, it turns kind of, you know, why, you know, it, it shouldn't be possible, but it turns out that it is possible. But this a little bit, knowing a little bit about your data set can improve your, uh, uh, your algorithm. And in particular for Euclidean space, one can prove basically that you can get an algorithm where basically the equivalent row becomes this quantity, which let's say for approximation two improves from four fruit of n to seven fruit of n, okay? And it turns out that this is optimal for data-dependent space partitions. Okay, so while I'll not show you Euclidean space, which achieves this optimal thing, I will tell you about a data-dependent local sensitive hashing. Um, hopefully this will be uh, pretty much new for everybody in the audience, uh, in, in, including some faculty here. Um, uh, so I'll show you an algorithm. It is 
I mean, while that optimal algorithm is very complicated, I'll show you a much simpler algorithm. Uh, it is for handling space. It doesn't achieve optimal one, but it achieves a better parameter, better parameter rho, than whatever was achieved through this bit sampling from the original index 20, which is also optimal for LSH. So, you know, some algorithm that somehow uses this data dependency to improve the algorithm. Here's how it goes. Hopefully I make a clicker work. Um, we will basically, <clears throat> again, have n to power rho for some parameter, no, you know, for some parameter rho, which will be better than that one, this one, okay? For each of them, instead of a hash table, we'll actually keep a decision tree. It's, it's almost equivalent, um, but, you know, just, you know, for us, it's, it's more convenient to keep a decision tree of height k, okay? And how does the decision tree looks like? Well, it's very similar to the bit sampling one, right? You take, uh, you take, you know, in the, in the root node, you pick, you, you fix a coordinate that you'll decide on, right? Let's say coordinate three. And, I, and depending on whether your coordinate is zero, you go to the left, and if it is one, you go to the right, right? And then in each node, you have a coordinate that you look at, right? So coordinate, you know, this node looks at coordinate two. If it's zero, then it goes here. If it's one, it goes here, right? So this, if this is of height k, then uh, this is, you know, this defines a hash function and the, the LSH that I described earlier pretty much is equivalent to saying that we take this decision tree where each coordinate here is a random coordinate. This is almost equivalent to the algorithm I've described so far for the handling space. Okay, just, just to give an example, here's an X. Uh, Right, so we look at coordinate three first, right, it's a one, we go here, we look at coordinate five next, it's a zero, so we go here, right, so, so X will go here and it will be, you know, if you suppose this is the, the leaves, right, then these, uh, uh, this X will be mapped into the bucket corresponding to this leaf. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, so th th this, is, this is the algorithm. Again, this is exactly equivalent to the algorithm for Hemings, for LSH algorithm for the Hemming space with this bit sampling LSH. Okay, so I mean, this, uh, this algorithm, a very close algorithm to it is, is closed LSH forest, uh, introduced by uh, Bavar, Condi, and Ganyasan. And uh, the only difference from this description is that it, it says something which is, you know, very natural kind of at least in practice to say, well, rather than fixing the depth of the tree, let me partition every node. You know, I have the entire data set, right? Let me partition every node until every bucket, right, every node of the tree contains just a constant number of points. Right, so somehow, you know, I fix a particular k. If this bucket becomes, you know, is too heavy, it has, you know, half the points, then I continue splitting it until we have, um, only constant number in each bucket, and again, for each node, we pick a random coordinate. Okay, so we, I mean, this feels a little bit like data dependent already because we split buckets further if we, are, if we have many data set points. It turns out that this algorithm still does not improve over this algorithm. Okay, so if you take kind of a bad case for LSH, this algorithm, right, this LSH forest algorithm that splits until the bucket sizes are constant will still give Raw, which is one over C. So namely, the number of trees that we need to take will be n to power raw. Okay, I, I should mention that, you know, the data structure basically, you know, splits the data set according to this tree. At the query time, you also kind of go see which bucket the query goes to, look from in that bucket, compare to every point. So it's exactly the same algorithm, except that, you know, this is the slight, a new definition of the function G that we use for LSH. Okay, so what our algorithm with uh, Ilya Rosenstein and uh, uh, Shekel Nazarsky, who is a PhD student here at Columbia, and Ilya Rosenstein used, uh, was a postdoc here actually. Um, so what, uh, what we did is we introduced a modification to this algorithm. Okay, this is the plus plus part, which is the following. It, 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 it looks like a very naive uh, modification. So what we do is that in every bucket, we store t points closest to the mean of the current uh, data set. Okay, so at this, node, at this node, you have the entire data set, 
Okay, you, you have the entire data set. Let's say this is the split according to the coordinate three here. Okay, so you take the, uh, let's say, I, and by the way, this improvement will work even for t equals to one, right? Even just store one extra point, right? So you look at these points, you compute the L1 mean of these points, you take the point which is closest to this L1 mean, let's say this point. You store it here. Then you split data set according to, let's say, you know, coordinate three, right, you know, this data set and this data set. Now, uh, for the, in, in this node, you again compute the, the, the mean of the points that, you know, hash into here. You take the point closest to the mean, you store it in this, in, into, in this uh, node and so forth. Okay, so here you, you store mean of these points. Okay, and at the query time, what you do, you know, you do the natural thing is, well, you still kind of go to the correct bucket. You find, you look what happens in that bucket. Okay, but also while you walk towards, let's say, you know, while you walk towards your bucket, you encounter a bunch of points which are stored in these internal nodes. You compare against them as well. Okay, so it's, you know, it's a, it feels like minimal modification. So the theorem is that you can obtain rho, which is equal to something like 0 0.72 by C, as long as C and T is large enough. Okay, and you know, you can actually, which is, you know, better than one over C, uh, and uh, even for T equals to one, you get an improvement over one over C, some constant, uh, you know, 0 0.9 by C, okay? We, you know, while we prove this theorem, you know, we still don't have a very good intuition why this happens. Uh, and, you know, we don't know if there is an equivalently simple algorithm that will get all the way to the optimal data dependent LSH for Hamming space. Okay, which for, again, for large C should be roughly half divided by C. Okay. All right, so this is, this is what I wanted to say about this. Uh, and this actually finishes with the data, uh, the data dependent uh, part. Uh, are there any questions about nearest neighbor search so far? Because from now on we'll, we'll kind of go into kind of final remarks and uh, in particular I'll talk about the and more part. Well, I managed to plug this laptop somewhere. Very good. Right. At least I, I feel proud I made him think, right? Uh, all right, cool. So uh, let's do the end more part. Um, all right, so um, there'll be pretty much two parts to the end more. Uh, so one is small dimension, okay? So I know the, the title of this lecture is high dimensional geometry, or you know, something related to high dimensional geometry. But what if D is small? Okay, what if dimension D is, 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 is actually small? Well, at least for nearest neighbor search and you know, for many related problems, you can solve up to let's say one plus epsilon approximation uh, with the following parameters. Your space is something like linear in N, pretty much the space to store all the points and the query time depends exponentially on the dimension, something like D by epsilon to the, to the dimension again with a factor log N, which you know, and there has been many uh, results, you know, of this sort, of this sort, improving a little bit the, the constant and the exponent. Uh, but you know, the general kind of motive is that well, your your runtime depends exponentially on the dimension. And you know, perhaps this is okay if your dimension is five. Okay, but you know, I give you example of images and say like, well, you know, dimension there is definitely not five, right? I mean, it's not like we have five pixel images, right? So usually dimension is not small, okay? All right, so what do I want to talk about? Well, what if dimension is effectively small? Okay, so maybe, yes, I mean the images, you know, don't have five pixels, but the degrees of variability in a sense, or, or degrees of freedom as, is actually much smaller than the number of pixels, right? And somehow, you know, for images, you expect that to be the case because, you know, it's definitely the, the degrees of freedom is not the number of pixels because, you know, we have a few objects, maybe, and you know, 
the image is composed of just a few variables to describe the image, right? Maybe this chair is present, this person is present, and that's it kind of thing. Okay, so, so what, what about this effectively, right? I mean, well, the question is really how to define this notion to be effective, uh, how to define the notion that dimension is effectively small. Okay, so let's start to kind of the simplest possible example kind of of what it would mean for dimension to be effectively small, uh, which is the following. So suppose, you know, the entire, you know, data set and the query points lives in a very high dimensional space dimension D, okay? But, but really kind of the query and the data set, you know, can only come from a fixed subspace of dimension K. So it's a linear subspace of dimension K where all the action happens. Okay, where K is much, much smaller than D. Okay, well then we can solve this nearest neighbor search in this subspace, right? So if you know that fixed subspace, you know, perhaps we can extract it from seeing the data set, we can just extract the subspace, project everything there, and just solve the nearest neighbor search there. Okay, that sounds good, but you know, and then you know, everything will be just exponential in K as opposed to the original dimension. Okay, but you know, it's not a robust definition, right? I mean, no data set will lie in a fixed linear subspace of small dimension. Right? There is always some noise and, and you know, some variability. It's not linear, probably. Okay, but there do exist more robust definitions uh, such as KR dimension, uh, doubling dimension, smooth manifolds, and so there are definitions. And I'll introduce one, which is you know perhaps one of the most commonly used one. Uh, doubling dimension, uh, originally introduced by Aswad in 83, again in functional analysis literature. And, um, and this is the definition that, you know, I, I'll, I'll use to state some results. So what is doubling dimension? Uh, well, we say the following. So given a point set S, <coughs> it has doubling dimension lambda, if the following thing holds, uh, for any point P, in this data set, and any fixed radius r, we consider the ball of radius r around this point. Okay, so let's say this is our data set. We consider uh, point P, a ball of radius r around it. We say the dimension, doubling dimension is lambda. If we can cover this ball with smaller balls of radius of half the radius, and the number of these balls is only two to power lambda. Okay, so this is, in, in a sense, kind of thing that my ball of radius r grows exponentially in lambda, right? Then we say that the dimension is lambda. Right, and this is kind of the natural analog in the Euclidean space where, you know, anything, let's say, of dimension k will go exponentially in k. So in particular, you know, for any such definition, you want to do a sanity check, checking that, let's say, your natural definitions that we already, you know, have used before correspond to this uh, definition of dimension as well. And indeed, if you take, say, high dimensional space of dimension D and you take a K dimensional subspace, linear subspace in it, and you compute its doubling dimension according to this definition, you'll get that lambda is equal to order K. So at least it corresponds, it captures the natural notions of, dif of dimensions that we had so far. Okay, so even if you take subspace, then you know you can always cover you, you take a ball of radius r in a k-dimensional uh, subspace, you can always cover it with balls of half the radius, and the number of balls you need is only two to order k. Okay? Another thing you can prove, uh, and this is true for any metric space, not just Euclidean space, that endpoints always have dimension at most order log n. So you should think that interesting dimension, this doubling dimension, is always upper bounded by log n. Okay, and again, it can be defined for any metric space. So this is this is another kind of you know good positive aspect of this definition of doubling dimension. But you know we don't you know we we can expand kind of our reach of techniques from you know what we we're discussing so far, which were very tailored to particular norms, let's say L2 or Hamming space. Then we can expand it to any metric space because you know this quantity is defined for any metric space. Okay. All right, so this is a definition. Can we do something with this definition? I mean, can we, you know, is it, is it a useful definition? Right? And, you know, the answer is yes. You can design nearest neighbor search, you know, the, the, the principle is that you can design nearest neighbor search algorithms 
whose complexity is exponential, not in the ambient dimension, kind of in potentially, you know, very high ambient dimension, but really in the doubling dimension. Okay, and, uh, you know, for example, for Euclidean space, uh, what you can do, you know, just to connect it to, you know, what we're talking so far, you can actually do, you can effectively re reduce the, this to Euclidean space on, in k-dimensional space. Right, so you have a data set, it is, uh, it has doubling dimension lambda. If you just use johnson Schraus dimension reduction and project it much more aggressively, so rather than projecting into log n dimensional space, which is what kind of jail guarantees to preserve distances for, you, you do it much more aggressively and reduce it to much smaller dimensional space, in particular k, which is only proportional to the doubling dimension, which is potentially even a constant, okay? And then you kind of build nearest neighbor search there, then the properties that you get from this dimension will be exactly good enough for our nearest neighbor search. In particular, what you can prove is that contraction of every pair, so given two points, what is the probability that their distance drops by more than a factor of one plus epsilon? Well, this probability will be very small. Okay, think about this exponentially small. Right? On the other hand, the expansion of a pair will happen with some non-trivial probability. So there is some constant probability that a, a pair of two points, after doing this very aggressive JL, uh, will actually expand, okay? So it is somewhat a symmetric type of guarantee that we used to have so far, where we're saying that, well, you know, we preserve distances up to one plus minus epsilon approximation with high probability. Here we have a symmetric thing where contraction still happens with very good probability, but expansion, uh, sorry, uh, well, happens with very small probability, but expansion can happen with some non-trivial probability. But it turns out that this kind of asymmetric guarantee is precisely good enough for nearest neighbor search. Because, well, what we want to guarantee is that, you know, so, you know, we have a query point, there is a, a, a neighbor, right? We want that for that neighbor, the distance under this dimension reduction doesn't suddenly increase a lot. And it's only one point, so it is okay that the expansion happens uh, only with constant probability, right? Because there is one point to care for. Where there are many points is the far points. And for far points, what we want to not happen is that they contract, they suddenly become much closer to the query. Okay, so we want that contraction happens with very small probability, which is exactly the guarantee we get from this aggressive jail. Okay, so this, this asymmetric guarantee happens to be precisely good enough on your number search. Okay, so this was, I mean, this was the result for Euclidean space, but actually you can do uh, algorithms, which again will be exponential in this is lambda uh, for arbitrary metric and uh, uh, first result was by Kraft-Geimer Lee. Uh, with the algorithm of navigating nets, and then there is uh, a later algorithm of cover trees, uh, which is practically very successful as well, uh, uh, that was uh, developed later. And um, yeah, basically these algorithms are some form of data dependent tree, I won't get into details, um, and uh, you know, basically the query time is exponential in this lambda. Okay, so as long as the doubling dimension is small, it is, it is okay. Okay, so um, I guess for, for how much longer can I talk? Uh, entire afternoon, right? It's like I have a meeting at two, though, right? That's, uh, yes. Uh, all right, so um, all right, so I uh, okay. I, I'll I'll try to stick to five minutes only. Sorry. Uh, okay, so second part of and more. Uh, basically, this is another. I don't know, very important idea, kind of, or, or very important tool in, in high dimensional geometry that, you know, again, kind of empowers kind of many more algorithms is the notion of metric embeddings, okay? And this is, uh, again, kind of these, these metric embeddings, and this is really a notion that comes, again, from functional analysis, and if it's, it's a very core concept there, okay? The motivation for it is as follows. Uh, suppose, you know, we talked about, say, sketching or nearest neighbor search, again, kind of going back to high dimensional situations, right? You know, we can't assume anything about doubling dimension. Um, so, so far, you know, when we're designing sketching and nearest neighbor search algorithms, we really talked about very 
very, very specific spaces, right? We talked basically about Euclidean space and handling space for L1. Okay, this is pretty much the only things for which we managed to do something non-trivial. Okay, in many applications, the type of distances or metrics that you want to, you know, to use could be very different, right? Uh, for example, uh, one uh, very kind of useful notion of distance or, or kind of dissimilarity between, let's say, images is what is called earth mover distance or Wachenstein distance in, in, in math, uh, also, uh, also called transportation distance in, in other literatures. And um, I mean, this is kind of one of the ways that, uh, I mean, one of the notions that was introduced in, in image vision for, co for comparing two images, right? For computing distance between images. Okay, and what it is, um, here's the formal definition. You're given two <coughs> sets, A and B, of points in symmetric space, and we'll just think about the plane, let's say. Okay, let's say green points and, and red points. We say the distance between these two sets of points is just the cost of minimum, you know, the, the cost, the value of the minimum cost matching between red versus, uh, red versus green matching. Okay, this is the minimum cost matching. The value of that is the F mover distance between these two sets of points. Okay. And again, it has applications in image vision because you can think about it as one way to compare images, how similar we are. Right? And I guess, um, you know, let's say you have one image, which is, I guess, gray. You want to say how similar it is to the, to the green image. Well, you, you want to kind of, you take the, the gray image, uh, kind of take it, define it as a set of points. You take the, the green image, you also define it as a set of points. And then you want to say like, well, how well can I match these points to these points? And the smaller the cost of this minimum cost matching, the more similar the images are. As hopefully this animation suggests. Okay, so this is, this is the definition. And, uh, you know, so now we say, well, now we want to do, you know, things for this space. Maybe we want to design some sketching algorithm for this or we want to design nearest neighbor search. How can we do that? <coughs> okay, I mean, for example, for nearest neighbor search, can we, you know, should we kind of going, you know, and designing some LSH function from scratch, right? And, you know, for every problem, you know, do we need to, design, you know, new algorithm for, it, for this metric, okay? So metric embedding is basically uh, a generic kind of approach or general tool for trying to deal with this kind of new metrics. Basically, they say that, well, once I have a, you know, very common kind of notion of, I guess, in math and, and CS, well, you know, you have a new problem, you already know a problem how, you know, but you know how to solve, well, you take a new problem, you try to reduce it to the problem you know how to solve. This is what metric embedding really is, right? It's a geometric notion of reduction from one metric space to another metric space. Formally, what it is, it is basically a function that maps sets into vectors to L1, such that the distance is approximated. Right? So it's very similar to dimensional reduction, except that we don't map from high dimensional two into low dimensional two, but we map from the space of EMD, basically F over distance, into the space of L2 or L1. Right, what, you know, whatever we can. Uh, but, you know, this target space should be the one where we can design algorithms. Right, and we want something that preserves uh, distances approximately, right? And then, you know, let's say we manage to do this into L1, then we can use algorithms for L1. Let's say, you know, LSH, the, the Enigma 20 LSH, right? Okay, so let's say for F over distance over a fixed grid, so two dimensional fixed grid, and discrete grid of size S, right? So it's S points, sorry, a grid of size S, S by S, right? So uh, there is a theorem, uh, basically, uh, basically two results, you know, proving very similar results, by Charika uh, and also Indic Papper, that showed that there exists a map, there is this embedding, that maps this earth mover distance over grids of size S by S in, in two-dimensional space into L1 with approximation which is order log S. Okay, I mean, maybe it is, you know, not the best possible approximation, but it gives some approximation. It gives some non-trivial result. Once we map into L1, we can do nearest neighbor search there and, and so forth. Right, and formally what does it mean is that, well, we have a map such that, you know, the distance, the L1 distance between maps of two sets A and B approximates the EMD distance between sets A and B after this factor of log S. 
Okay, and you know, it implies a bunch of sketch results and nearest neighbor search with approximation order logins. Okay, and you know, let me just kind of flip through the rest of the slides a little bit and, and just go to the conclusion. Um, and I mean, this has been studied, right? Now it becomes kind of a mathematical question of designing these metric embeddings, and it has been studied for a bunch of kind of these specialized distances. You know, some variants of F mover distance, also some variants of edit distance. So edit distance is the number of insertions, deletions, or substitutions to transform one string into the other. But this is a very natural distance between strings or time series or, or genes, for example. Okay, and there are some bounds. Um, and, uh, you know, some are better than others, right? I mean, in particular, this stands out as something not particularly great. This is more than logarithmic. Um, but also, kind of interestingly, that there are also lower bounds saying that, well, you can push these things only so far. Okay, so for a bunch of these, of these metrics, there are lower bounds. Uh, some of them are nearly matching. I mean, mostly not. I guess yeah, this is nearly matching, but mostly not. And, you know, it's still an open question kind of, you know, to find the best embedding uh, results. But, you know, basically it also suggests that there are some bound, you know, bounds of how much can you do, right? There is some, some fixed boundaries of how far you can push these things. Okay. Uh, the, you know, turns out that there are kind of, you know, things which are beyond these L1 embeddings, uh, including embeddings into richer spaces, but which are still tractable to saying like, well, maybe there are other things that we can still design nearest neighbor search more directly and embed into those spaces. And indeed there are uh, like an infinity or combinations of these spaces. Uh, so some, you know, turns out that something like well, a variant of edit distance, which doesn't embed into L1 with good approximation, turns out to embed into some combination of L1s or, and L infinities with uh, constant approximation, actually. And, you know, there are kind of data-dependent kind of algorithms that kind of go beyond. I don't really have time to talk about this. Um, let me just conclude. This is, I guess, the, you know, the <coughs> next to last slide. Um, j just to mention kind of more about high-dimensional geometry. So, you know, there is, there is no way I can really talk about the entire algorithmic applications of high-dimensional geometry. There are many things that were left out. In particular, uh, many of the things that, I mean, the, the, uh, the high-dimensional geometry has been useful in computer science for developing algorithms, but in, I guess, slightly, in a sense, deeper in theoretical computer science. So, you know, things maybe which are not directly related to machine learning, uh, but the, the type of things that I particularly left out are metric embeddings of fixed finite metric spaces. Uh, into simpler or more structured spaces like L1. And I mean, one of the uh, kind of, uh, perhaps, you know, one of the highlight kind of, you know, this line of things just to, you know, highlight something is uh, that we can solve the sparsest cut. So this is a graph problem using these geometric techniques with approximation, which is root log n, which is the best known uh, thing. And, you know, this really uses this notion of uh, metric embeddings. Um, okay, and uh, okay, sorry, this is the, the last conclusion slide. So, you know, what we're really talking about is this high dimensional, high, high dimensional geometry tools, which a lot are about how to represent kind of complex data into simpler data, either because it is smaller or just more convenient to work with, like in space partitions. And we used those tools to develop efficient algorithms for a bunch of problems. Uh, so the type of applications we've seen for numerical linear algebra, for streaming, right, these router problems, uh, nearest neighbor search, uh, and nearest neighbor search in this lecture. Uh, there are many more things that are, you know, can be used, uh, these kind of high-dimensional geomet geometric techniques can be used, you know, for other, yet for uh, more other things. And some of the other things that, you know, if I were to have more time, uh, would have liked to talk about is sketching of graphs. So it turns out that you can take graphs and somehow sketch them, so reduce their space while preserving many of the graph properties like distances uh, or cut values and, and so forth. Um, also, kind of another thing is, uh, uh, you know, I was trying to talk about like, oh, there's embeddings, there's sketching, you know, somehow suggesting that there are different tools. There, are, there is also theory being built about around them where we try to connect these things kind of in a kind of more rigorous manner. In particular, uh, there is 
um, there is a theorem basically that says that a normed space X has a small sketch. You know, you know, all this has to be quantified. But basically, the, the, the principle of the theorem is the following: if the sketch, if if the a norm has a small sketch, right, in the notion that I defined earlier today in the morning, then it turns out this is exactly equivalent to saying that it embeds the notion of this metric embedding with constant distortion into some LP space where P is a little bit less than one. Okay. And uh, another type of uh, results, and uh, I guess this is you know, probably like the biggest kind of left out part, is more data dependent algorithms or these adaptive algorithms, which you know, in a sense they say like, well we design an algorithm rather than using these tools which are oblivious to the data set, we pick them randomly like dimension reduction or, or sketch or, or these space partitions, rather than picking them randomly independently of the data set, well usually we have the data set at hand we want to apply it to that data set at hand, so maybe we can adapt our tools, our these maps to the data set and improve the quality, and indeed in many cases you can do this, you know, the preconditioners are really what, you know, are used in numerical linear algebra, uh, which, you know, over iterations adapt to the data set. Also I mentioned kind of a glimpse of that for nearest number search as well. Um, and uh, yeah, with that I, I, I'll end my lectures, yeah. Thank you.